Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the DDPS seminar. Uh, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you do have questions, you are welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to the external audiences. Uh, therefore, no classified discussion is allowed. Uh, so please watch out. Finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker today. Okay, it is an honor to host Yeonjung Shin, uh, who is a Prager Assistant Professor at the Division of Applied Mathematics, Brown University. Um, uh, it's well known that it's a home of the Physics Informed Neural Network, uh, which is the, uh, the most popular, uh, the machine learning based physics uh, solver these days. He completed his PhD in mathematics at the Ohio University. Ohio State University in 2018, advised by Professor Dongbin Xiu. His research interests lie in mathematics of machine learning, scientific computing, approximation theory, and uncertainty quantification. Today, Yeon Jung will talk about mathematical understanding of modern machine learning in theory, algorithms, and applications, which is very interesting topic. So please enjoy and expect a wonderful talk. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Yeonjung by asking one random question as usual. Today's random question is, what is your favorite things to do other than research? Oh, I have, to, I have, to, I have one peculiar thing to do, watching YouTube videos uh, twice faster than normal speed. Okay. Okay. <laughs> to to save your time? Yes. Okay. And wow. watch many watch as many as materials so quickly. So <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. That is a that is a skill. Okay. It's all yours, Yanja. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, Young Su. Uh today I'm going to talk about some of my works on uh, machine learning. Um Machine learning based AI technologies have revolutionized both industry and academia. It's not a big surprise to nowadays to see a news article that AI techniques can do wonder. It has achieved a tremendous success on many challenging applications. Here I listed some of the famous examples, starting from AlphaGo, AlphaFold, and some image generations, and even AI composes classical music. And more recently, these machine learning techniques have been applied to solve scientific problem. So this is the uh, one line I borrowed from DOE document. The scientific machine learning is a core component of AI and computation technology that can be trained with the scientific data to automate as human skills. And many companies also have huge interest in this field. So here I show a couple of examples. Uh, NVIDIA, they use machine learning model, what they called SimNet, to develop the next generation GPU. And their core technique is called physics informed neural network, which I will introduce in a moment. And also Siemens also interested in using it in their digital, twil, digital twin models. And also ANSYS is also uh, employed those uh, techniques. Machine learning is very powerful as demonstrated. Some people even call it as a magical black box and put whatever data they have into machine learning algorithms and expect to get some great result. However, this is not true. Much of this success involves lots of trial and error and uh, many tricks. And at the moment, uh, it's safe to say that we lack basic mathematical understanding of machine learning, when, it, when and why it works. This is very important as machine learning is getting applied to make life critical decisions such as autonomous vehicle. The general goals as a, an applied and computational mathematician is to provide mathematical guarantees and based on that to develop fast 
robust and reliable numerical method and algorithms for machine learning. Then why deep learning so successful? So what I view is there are four components that leads this tremendous success. One is the modeling, which is a neural network and techniques that can train those model, which is typically done by gradient based optimization. And along with the big data and powerful computing power, then combining all these together, we achieve some great success. And as a mathematician, the personally more interested in these two perspective, neural network and the gradient based optimization. So this is a typically the dim learning. Then what is different, different in scientific machine learning? Uh, what has been changed is the, our data now becomes scientific data. And on the top of this, we have laws of physics. Physical laws are the conclusions based on long year scientific observations and experiments. So the goal is we want to incorporate those laws of physics into the neural network. And physics informed neural network is one of them to trying to do that. The rest of this talk will be themed by the data-driven approximation. So the goal is to approximate a known target function f star, which can be a solution to the PDE, or if you are interested in some image classification, or then f star can be image classifier. And what is known to us is the data or some prior knowledge. So what I mean by data is an input-output pair. Xi is an input and Yi is its corresponding output. Some domain knowledge could be some PDEs. And to achieve this goal, we typically need to choose the two things. One is the parameterized model classes. So in this talk, I will focus on neural network. But classically, we were a numerical analyst were using uh, polynomials or wavelets. And once the parameterized model classes were chosen, the next thing is to decide the approximation schemes. Approximation schemes can be decomposed into the two step. The first step is the formulation of the loss, and the second step is the minimize the loss. Then this actually creates the uh, multiple fundamental questions, that, which I will illustrate in this slide. Suppose f star is our target function we wish to approximate. And to do this, we choose a model class. And in this talk, this model class will be neural network. Then let's say H hat is the best model belongs to this model class to approximate this F star. Then study of these two difference, and uh, this error is called the approximation error, and study of this error belongs to the classical approximation theory. In this error, data doesn't play any role. So this error is completely determined by our target function and your choice of the model class. So there's no data plays in a role in this error. And now data comes in, we define a loss function. Then let's say HM is our minimizer of the loss function. Here, small m is denoted by the number of the data. Then the difference between this minimizer and the best function is called estimation error. This error comes from the finiteness of our data. So if we were to have infinitely many number of data, then this error will be zero. Then combining these two errors together, we call it generalization error. So in some sense, the understanding generalization error is the realm of some theoretical work. But what we see in practice after uh, training of the gradient descent algorithm, what we get is H tilde. So this is the outcome of our algorithm. Then the difference between these two is called optimization error. So in this talk, I was going to talk about the both. So first part, I will talk about the generalization error in terms of the physics informed neural network. And the second part, I will focus on optimization, especially uh, mathematical analysis of some machine learning phenomena in trained neural net, the Flato phenomena and the dying Rayleigh. Since all of those topics involved in neural network, so let me first uh, just uh, go over what is neural network. So starting with the input X lies in D-dimensional space, we apply an affine map to get Z1. Here, W1 is a matrix, B1 is a uh, vector, and W1 is called a weight matrix, 
and B1 is called bias vector. And then we apply a nonlinear map phi, and then again, another affine map to get Z2. And then we repeat this procedure until we get ZL. Then the mapping from X to ZL is called L layer neural network. And the collection of those weight matrices and the bias vector is called the network of parameters. And this is something we need to learn. And the network architecture is just a collection of the size of the weight matrices. So for example, W1 is the matrix of size N by D and intermediate layer is the N by N and the last layer is the one by N. So here I assume the output uh, is just a the real valued function. And typically, L is called the depth of the network, small n is the width of the network, and phi is called activation function. Some popular choices, the hyperbolic tonnage uh, and the uh, ReLU function, which is just the max function. Then with that, let me talk about the convergence theory of a physics-informed neural network. Physics-informed neural network is a deep learning framework for solving PDE. Uh, this was first appeared on the archive in November 2017, and merely within three years and eight months, it already cited more than 1,600 times. And PIN also has appeared on media multiple times, but here I show the first uh, time I uh, saw PIN in the media. So NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang addressing AI for science in the supercomputing seminar in 19, and he's mentioning PIN. The principle is the same as before, trying to uh, embed the physics equation into the neural network. And one way of doing it is the pin. The setup for the pin is goes follow. So I will focus on the for the problem, although uh, pin can be applied for both way, but for theoretical analysis, I will focusing on the for the problem. So we consider the following PDE. Here L is the differential operator and B is a boundary operator and F and G are PD data, then U and G, uh, U and boundary of U is just a standard, the open and bounded. Then the goal is to find a neural network that approximate the PDE solution. And what are known to us is the two things. One is the pointwise PDE data, some data from the interior and the data from boundary. And if you completely know about F and G, then this, you may think of this is not a data or something you can get freely. But if you don't know F and G, then you can treat this as a data. And on the top of that, we might know, we know the physics equation in terms of L and the B. So as I said, the goal is to encode the physics equations and some data into the neural network. Then how we do this for the pin, the original work uh, proposed to do this job by minimizing the loss function. Then prototype pin loss function is defined in the following manner, composed with the two terms. One is the mean square loss of the interior part, both physics and the data. And the other term is the mean square error of the boundary, physics and the data. The method is to minimize this pin loss function and we get the minimizer, which is the network parameter. Then by using this minimized parameter back to neural network, we get a physics informed neural network. Then why pins? Uh, there are multiple pros and cons for the pins, but uh, one, one part is easy and simple to implement it. And someone, uh, someone said, Someone also saying as a joke, the high school student can solve the Schrodinger equation using PIN uh, after spending a couple of hours. And the second one is the is a, one, of, one of the uh, methods that solve the PDE without meshes and also great potential in solving inverse problem, especially, and also take advantage of the rapid development of deep learning. Yet, it lacks a theoretical understanding and also has some uh, potential issues in optimization procedure. But at the moment, for the first part, I will focusing on just the theoretical analysis, assuming minimizer is achieved. And one natural question one might ask is the consistency, con consistency 
uh, reserved, meaning that here M denotes the number of the data point. Then for fixed number of the data point, we get a neural network, physics informed neural network. Then the natural question, a natural question would be as the number of the data point increase, we get a sequence of the physics informed neural network. Then the question is, will this sequence of physics informed neural networks converges to the solution to the PDE? If it is, then we say it is a consistent. For the analysis, we propose so-called held regularized pin loss. It is the regularized pin loss in particular use of the held constant of the L of the neural network and B of the neural network. So we are going to focusing on the following problem, minimize the held regularized pin loss and theta star is our uh, uh, optimum parameters that we get a neural network. And as the number of data increase, we get a sequence of the neural network. The question I will want to address today is the whether this sequence will converge to the PD solution or not. If it is, in what norm? And the answer is yes, and the norm is the uniform. And let me briefly talk about what is the motivation of using Helder regularized loss. Ideally, what we want to minimize is the expected pin loss, meaning just we want to minimize the L of H minus F in continuous norm and B of H minus G in continuous norm. That is corresponding to this expected pin loss. However, we cannot achieve this, we cannot access to this expected pin loss so that we somehow sort of like minimizing empirical loss. But one theorem we prove is the following. Uh, by assuming our samples are IID, then with high probability, expected pin loss can be bounded by held the regularized pin loss. And uh, this other term actually goes to zero as the number of the data increase. And this pre, uh, this pre uh, suggest one way of controlling expected pin loss in a nice manner. And in this upper bound, actually, we did not apply any optimization procedure yet. So this is purely obtained by applying probabilistic space filling argument. So by applying the optimization, by reducing this Helder regularized loss is sufficiently decay fast that we can expect to get some convergence. So in order to guarantee the convergence, we need to uh, impose some proper conditions on the neural network class. Because what we get is this HM, which is minimizer. And in order for the convergence, we need to uh, sort of like guarantee that this generalization error goes to zero, which means that approximation error has to go to zero, which means that neural network class should be sufficiently large enough to capture this target function. At the same time, we need to a way to control this estimation error so that we can reduce the convergence. We can uh, derive the convergence. And from now on, for the ease of the notation, I will use this functional notation because the neural network is determined by the network parameter, meaning that we can choose a function in the neural network class. So I was going to use this functional notation. Then there are two key assumptions on the, for the convergence. One is the interpolation of the data. There exists a function, the neural, neural network, that interpolates the, the data, which means that achieve the zero pin loss, the prototype pin loss. This assumption controls the approximation error. And the second assumption is the uniform boundedness of the held constant. And this controls the estimation error. And these two assumptions are essential for the proof, although the assumption one can be relaxed a bit. Yet, these two assumptions can be both satisfied if the, there exists a neural network uh, that is exactly the solution to the PDE. Then with these two critical assumptions, now we can have some convergence reject. Suppose the assumption one and two hold, and let's say HM is the minimizer of the held regularized loss. Then with high probability, expected pin loss evaluated at our minimizer actually converges to zero with the following rate. 
So this is the worst case rate of convergence. Furthermore, L of the physics informed neural network, B of the physics informed neural network converges to the PDE data uniformly. So this is a great result in the sense that we guess we can guarantee some sort of like convergence after applying the operators. However, this uniform convergence is not strong enough to conclude the con solution, uh, convergence to the PDE. So one example is this, so that all the derivative converges to zero uniformly, but function itself does not. So this is the moment we need to specify what kind of the class of the PDE we are looking for. So in that, we actually borrow the Schauder theory from PDE and combine it with the maximum weak maximum principle. The Schauder theory guarantees the, the pointwise evaluation and sufficient regularity and the uniqueness of the solution. And weak maximum principle controls the how we deviate from the boundary. Because unlike other PD method, PIN does not enforce the boundary condition to be satisfied in the first place. So there must be a, some uh, technical tool that controls the boundary values in, in some nice manner. And that is the weak maximum principle. By combining all this, we can now have a nice convergence theorem. Suppose the assumptions hold, uh, conclude, uh, con uh, involving the child assumption and weak maximum principle and the uh, two assumptions that I mentioned earlier. And HM is the Helder minimi uh, minimizer of the Helder regularized loss. Then with probability one over IID sample, sequence of the physics informed neural network converges to the solution to the PDE uniformly. And furthermore, if the neural network satisfy the boundary conditions exactly, then the convergence mode become H1. And here are some proof idea, but let me skip it. But similar result holds for parabolic case. Here I show some demonstration. So the purpose of this plot is to just illustrate the convergence of pin to the PD solution, just to what I just show you before. So here I consider the special case where uh, held exponent is one, which becomes a lattice regularization, which is shown by red. And the standard prototype pin loss result is shown by blue curve. And here dashed line is the rate of convergence from our theory. Then you can see that uh, theoretical result is well observed by the numerical simulation as well. And but what, what is interesting is actually the without any regularization, just a standard physics informed neural network seems to converge exponentially fast and saturate afterwards which is something we cannot guarantee from the theory. But red one is guaranteed by the theory. And similar result holds for the heat equation. The upper dashed line is our theoretical line and the red one is our numerical simulation. And the blue one is the standard physics informed neural network. Now let me move on to my second topic, which is the optimization error. So mainly I will going to discuss the two things. One is the selector phenomena and the dying ray loop. For the optimization, the setup is the following. The goal is to approximate an unknown target function, f of star, and our data is just xi and yi data set, uh, and model class is the neural network, and approximation scheme is the neural network training, which I will going to uh, discuss a little bit more. So training refers to a procedure of finding appropriate network parameters that minimize the loss function. Here I assume the mean squared loss. And typically this loss is minimized by gradient descent like method. And typically gradient descent like method involves with the two steps. Step one, is the random initialization of the parameter. And step two is repeated application of some iterative schemes until converge. However, this is difficult to solve because it is non, not convex and also nonlinear. At the same time, this is the part where many intriguing phenomena are observed. And those are uh, plateau phenomena and the dying rail loop. 
Let me first illustrate uh, what is the flat phenomena. So here we consider a simple learning task, just uh, trying to approximate a sine function using two layer rail network of width 100. And we train it with using just a standard gradient descent using full batch and learning rate is the 10 to the minus three. And this figure shows the training loss versus the number of iteration. And we see that the loss decrease fast to get fast in the early phase and then quickly saturates. And some may even think that uh, training is done and may terminate the training at this point. However, if we continue gradient descent, what we see is here. The loss suddenly decreased fast again before saturating at around 10 million iteration. And if we go further, we see that similar behavior repeated. This is so-called flat phenomena. Then why flat phenomena is a problem? Well, as you can see, it made us too difficult to decide when to terminate the procedure. And furthermore, it makes the training very slow. So therefore, the goal for us is to understand what are the root causes of this phenomena. And once we identify the root causes, then can we avoid it and make a fast convergence? I mean, fast some training method. And that was our motivation. But to address this question, we need to understand some basic understanding of gradient descent training dynamics. Will it converge? If it is, then will it find a good solution or not? So I will going to go over all these questions in SQL. Here is the setup. We consider the simplest setup we can think of, but not too trivial, is the univariate ReLU network here, which is written in the following manner. And you may notice that we don't have the W here because the phi is the ReLU so that it is the homogeneous, positive homogeneous so that without loss of generality, you can do this. And the one simplest example is that when small n equal to one and the c equal to c one equal to one, then this is just the max function, a little bit uh, not located at b one. Then this is our one realization of this neural network. For the training, we consider the square loss function and consider the gradient flow dynamics. So from now on, we are going to assume that this theta is the function of time t governed by this dynamics. And this is our primary interest of the parameter. And want to know that how this function behave as the training goes on. For this analysis, one of the, there are two key concepts for understanding of this analysis. One is activation patterns. The other is macroscope data. I will illustrate what are those in this exam, uh, in the following illustration. Suppose we have five neurons, which is shown as the red dot, and we have 10 training data point, which is the purple cross marks. Then with respect to each neurons, we can define a partition of the training data. So those four point, left four point belongs to this U0 set and the middle two purple dots belongs to U1 set and U2 set is the empty, et cetera. Then what we mean by activation pattern is the size of each U set. So in this example, U0, small U0 is the cardinality of the capital U0 set, so that which is the four, and U1 is two, et cetera. And collection of all these numbers is what we call activation patterns. And macroscopic data is its corresponding averaged data. So by average of this full point is the macroscopic data corresponding to the U0 set. And same thing for the U1 goes on. So these two are the most important concepts in understanding uh, flat phenomena and the training method I will going to explain in later. Then with that, uh, I'm going to show our main, well, first main result. Uh, before that, here is uh, some notation. Here we consider the loss vector. 
for each of the component is the discrepancy between our neural network and the output data evaluated at the case data point. So naturally the norm of this loss vector becomes the, our original the target loss function. The one main result is the following. For time interval on which the activation patterns do not change, there exists a linear subspace such that the loss does not decay at all in its complement space, but it decays exponentially fast on this corresponding V space. So meaning that for the time being where activation patterns do not change, we get a fast conversions on this subspace and the rest of them are just a remainder of this part. So this flateau is converges to the orthogonal complement of the loss uh, vector. So in other words, a plateau corresponds to a period of time during which the activation patterns do not change. So that is the root cause of, cause of why plateau phenomena occurs. And next, we provide some quantitative result of the gradient flow, mainly will gradient flow converge or, and the will gradient flow find a good solution or not. So again, theta t follows this following gradient flow dynamics. And the one partial theorem, the partial convergence theorem we prove is the following. Suppose that there exists a time interval, the t from infinity, where activation patterns do not change. Then theta t converges to a stationary point. Then this provides a partial convergence result. The next question is then what is the stationary point and how it looks like? So we quantify the if and only if condition for a point being a stationary, but I want to emphasize just one thing on this lemma. So this condition shows that fully trained network interpolates macroscopic data. I will going to explain this theorem and lemma in the next uh, slide here. Suppose we are trying to fit the five data points shown in here. One, two, three, four, five is a double shape. And we train with the ReLU network of width eight, just GD and constant running rate, et cetera. And you can see that fully trained network interpolate all the macroscopic data, which is shown as the red dots here. And here, furthermore, here we show the training trajectories of the biases and the coefficient with respect to the number of uh, iterations. And here, black dashed line corresponds to five data points. And what we can see here is at around the 10 to the five iteration, you can see that all the biases are somehow stabilized, which meaning that we have fixed activation pattern afterwards. Meaning that after 10 to the five iteration, for the rest, we have the fixed activation pattern so that we should expect to have conversions based on our theorem. And this is what's happening as you can see in the coefficient. Once the biases are stabilized, now coefficients become converged and we have reached the convergence. And also one thing is related to the later dying ReLU, you can see that these two upper two does not change at all during the training. And this is because of the dying ReLU, which I will going to explain in the last topic. All right, then now we know that will gradient flow converge or not and how it looks like. And the final result is the, this, uh, will gradient flow provide a good solution or not? And here is what we proved. A fully trained network continuously connect consecutive least squares line. So let me explain what it means in the, this flow. So suppose we have these neurons shown as the green dot and cross marks our, our training data. Then we focus on just a UJ set, which is the interval that corresponding to interlaced of the consecutive neurons. Then by focusing only this realm, we can just fit a least square line by using those five data point. And same thing can be done for other realm. And it's macroscopic data is the red dot. So the least square line actually uh, passes through this macroscopic data and 
what fully trained neural network could do is continuously connect these least square lines. What the flow and gradient descent training do, and at this moment, no further movement is possible by gradient descent. All right, then all these theoretical results we gained provide some insightful result. So one is the plateau is the period during which the activation patterns do not change. And the second observation is that once biases are fixed, the optimal coefficients can be obtained by solving the least squares problem. And this combined these two, we propose a new training method, which is we call active neuron least squares. The idea is that we want to generate candidate bias vectors that have different activation patterns. And then we solve the least square and choose the one with the smallest loss value. And here, let me quickly recall you what was the activation pattern. So given the five data, five neurons here, and each neuron actually uh, partition the data and the collection of these, the, the size of each U set cons constitute the, what we mean by activation pattern then actually we can manually uh, change the activation pattern. For example, if we move the first neuron to the left, then this creates the new activation pattern. So you can see that uh, here is a number of the data point of U0 set was full, but by moving the first neuron to the left, oops, we get the U0 set becomes three, U1 set becomes three. And do the same thing if we move the first neuron to the right, then we got U0 set 5 and U1 set 1. So in this manner, we can create uh, multiple candidate vectors that generates a different activation pattern. So this is the one example, another example, etc. Then among all these different candidate bias, we get a different activations. Then we choose the one with the smallest loss value. And we have a efficient, very efficient procedure of choosing the best one, but let me skip that one and show the performance. So this is the one dysfunctional approximation task. So this is a target function, is a discontinuous, left one is the low frequency, the right one, uh, right one is a somehow high frequency here. And here is the training loss versus the number of iteration. And uh, we compared with the gradient descent, ADAM and so-called LSBD, LSADAM. So applying least square and uh, gradient descent ADAM uh, iteratively, and the black solid line is the just the standard least square at the right after the initialization, and the blue one is the uh, training result by active neuron least square. You can see that with the merely hundred iteration, it already achieved the best training loss, and compare and also in terms of the CPU time also is the shortest time and get the smallest loss. And what about the generalization error? So here I show the prediction error here, and you can see that an active neural least square achieved the best result among others. One particular thing is the following. If you see the green dashed line and uh, our blue line, you see the training error is roughly the same. However, when you see the prediction error, active neural least square actually generate the pro, produce the more uh, great result on the generalization performance. So active neural least square also generalizes well. And we also extended this method to the multiple dimensional task. So this is the one example for the 2D function approximation. The target function is so-called the booking function, which is a quite uh, difficult function to be approximated because if you see the values of the function, it goes up to zero to 200. And also you see that there is a sharp belly uh, in, the, in here where that somehow non-differentiable part has appeared. And here is to show the training loss versus the number of the iterations. You can see that active neural square is uh, perform roughly four orders of the magnitude better than any of the, any of the other method. And this is also CPU time and also not to mention about the generalization error. Achieve the smallest generalization error and the smallest training loss. And this can be readily applied to solve the pin. So one of the bottleg of the pin 
uh, some might people call is the it's hard to optimize or uh, there are multiple some issues, but without changing any activation function or without changing any neural network architecture, we just use the two layer neural network and trained with active neural list secure, we can solve this wave equation nicely. And here I show the training result and the relative L2 error. Relative L2 error is shown as the dashed line. And you can see that active neural list secure is the only method that works. Then none of them are working really well, but achieve the 10 to the minus six training loss and relative error is roughly 10 to the minus three level. And here is the absolute value error uh, plot on the domain for the wave equation. So that was the plateau phenomena. And the last one is the dying ReLU. So let me illustrate what is the dying ReLU. So suppose we want to approximate the absolute value of X, which is simple function. But someone said the deep neural network is a very powerful. So suppose you want to use the 10 layer ReLU network of width two. Theoretically, this neural network is powerful enough to exactly represent this absolute value of X because of the following relation. So absolute value of X is just the addition of the two neuron. Identity map is also addition of the two neuron so that you can just decompose the absolute value of X and just identity map recursively. So target function can be exactly represented by a neural network. But when you actually train it, then what you get is nine out of the 10 times, you see that this flat dashed line. So this is the trained result. And this the blue line, blue solid line is our target function. So you can see that clearly there is a huge gap between theory and practice. And in terms of this, the diagram that I showed you earlier, there's no approximation error because it can be exactly represented by this the 10 layer with two ReLU network the target function. So there is a no approximation error. And also there's a no or negligible estimation error because we train it over 3000 training data or more for only just approximating this simple 1D function. So generalization error is negligible or none. So this is mainly because of the optimization error and what's happening here. So dying ReLU, is our uh, uh, reason why this happening. So that really, in simple words, neuron becomes a constant function. So this is the one, some illustrating example. Suppose you have two rail neurons going this word and that word. And if your data point lies between this, then when you evaluate this data, uh, these neurons on this data point, it becomes all, always zero. So why then, why this is a problem? Because we use the gradient based training and gradient of the constant function is zero. So gradient descent does not work. So this is the simple explanation of 1D parameter set, setup. So if we start with this red realm and you'd apply the gradient descent, it doesn't update at all and just it stay there and just nothing happen. So, the question is then in a more general setup, what, how likely we start our initialization in this red realm? And recall that when applying gradient descent like algorithm, we randomly initialize the parameters. But one thing we often forgotten is the step zero. We need to choose a network architecture, which network architecture would be more preferable. And what we quantify is definitely depending on the depth and the width, the probability that you start with your optimization in the red realm actually changes. So to this end, we want to quantify dying probability. So more rigorously, we define some probability space and uh, given a neural network architecture, then we define the event where network become a constant. So we want to identify how likely this time probability would be depending on your network architecture. So one asymptotic result we show is the following. Given a neural network, deep neural network, and suppose your 
network parameters are IID from symmetric distribution, then dying probability goes to one if you fix the width and let the depth goes to infinity. And furthermore, if you fix the depth and the width goes to infinity, then this dying probability is a zero. And this is somehow explains why in practice, the wide network is so successfully used and not a uh, deep and narrow network. Although deep and narrow network enjoy some quite useful or theoretical guarantees. So in simple words, probabilistic explanation on when dying ReLU occur. Simple words, a deep ReLU network will eventually die in probability, while a wide ReLU network will not die in probability. So this is a symptotic result, and we can go further to provide a non-asymptotic result. And here we assume some standard assumption. The double the weight matrices are from Gaussian and Bij is zero, which is the common in practice, such as the He initialization or Xavier initialization. But we have somehow restrict ourselves to the one dimensional case due to technical difficulties. But to the end, what we can get is the lower and upper bound simultaneously. And this can be illustrated by the following figure. Here we show the dying probability with respect to the number of hidden layer at different width, two to 10. Upper and the lower dashed lines is coming from our upper and the lower bound and the solid mark are our empirical simulation obtained from 1 million uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And one particular thing you can see that these two bounds are pretty accurate to capture all the result. And in particular, when the number of hidden layer is 10 and the width is two, we can see that dying probability is 0 0.09, which is same as what we empirically observed. So this is accurately predict what we have observed in practical situation in approximating absolute value of X. Okay, then now how we avoid dying ReLU. There are multiple choices you can avoid the dying ReLU, but if you want to use the deep and narrow network, then there are other options we propose. And why deep and narrow? Well, it enjoys some optimal density properties as proposed by many uh, methods. For example, a uh, key building block of showing the universal approximation theorem is multi, uh, construct a multiplication operator. And if you look at how those uh, network are constructed, they're in their fundamental level, they construct a deep and narrow network. And to this end, what we have proposed is the randomized asymmetric initialization. The idea is breaking the symmetry because all the existing methods utilizing symmetric distribution. Actually, the symmetric distribution actually in a uh, fundamental reason why uh, we often face this the dying ReLU, especially when the number of the depths goes large. So idea is the random selection and initialize via specific beta distribution. And this can be obtained theoretically by controlling the, the expected square length of the output of the network. Then by utilizing our proposed method, we can drastically reduce the dying probability. So here is the dying probability with respect to the number of a hidden layer. And here is the width two and red line is the one obtained by our result. And the he initialization and orthogonal initialization are doesn't very helpful in reducing the dying probability. And actually this also improved the robustness of the training here I show the same learning task approximating the absolute value of X. Then A is the completely failure, just uh, become collapsed. And uh, B is the partial collapse and C is a successful training. And you can see that by only changing initialization, the probability of getting A is reduced by roughly 50% and half training increased by like 20% and number of success is increased by 35%. And we also apply this initialization technique for the MNIST test and five independent simulation. We see that all the result initialized by the randomized asymmetric initialization produces the all good result. However, just using key initialization, you can see that you may face in some failure of the training and some uh, 
the test accuracy is deteriorate in some cases. Okay, so here's the summary. So I presented some, uh, the first convergence theory of the physics informed neural network is based on the Helder regularization method. And this provide a consistency result of the physics informed neural network. So basically, and mathematically, it will give you the correct answer if you can get a good optimizer. And next, we I discussed some uh, optimization perspective and explained uh, two uh, machine learning phenomena coming from training neural net. One is the flat phenomena, the other is the dying rail loop. And based on the theoretical understanding, we proposed the new algorithms that have improved the training of the neural network. One is the active neural list squares. As you can see, it drastically improved the training performance. And just as in the, for example, the pin example is a solvable versus not solvable case. And uh, for the dying ReLU, we proposed the randomized symmetric initialization so that this allow you to explore some options of using deep and narrow network in particular cases. And here are some references, and that's what I have prepared for today. And I'm happy to take uh, any and questions. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Th th thank you so much, Yeonjung. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, although it was a theoretically oriented, I was able to follow clearly. Um, that was amazing. Uh, amazing thank you so job, much. Yeonjung. Okay, so, so we much. do have we do have a questions. Um, okay, the first question. Okay, by the way, do you have a uh, access to the chat chat box? Oh, okay, let me see. If if you move your mouse to the top of the uh, shared screen, then there is an option. Um, ah, okay. The chat chat option. Okay, so so that you can have access to. Okay, the question okay. from Lauren. The first first question. Um, is regarding slide 19 uh, for mm -hmm. your assumption number one, which is exist existence of a suitable well-behaved interpolation function. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I understood that correctly. Um, is the is the satis uh, satisfaction of such an assumption likely to be problematic when the data is coming not from the actual PDE, but rather from potentially noisy experimental data that the PDE is attempting to model? Yeah, yeah actually, that's a, that's a very good question. So the assumption, so at this moment, we don't assume any noisiness of our uh, PDE data. So we somehow assume some ideal cases where we don't have any noise, but noise can be easily incorporated under certain tweaks. So as I mentioned here, there are uh, assumption one can be relaxed. So that part actually requires that uh, you don't need to actually in exactly interpolate all the data, but there's a, some uh, allowance you can offer by, off by, and that is determined by certain rate dependent. But as far as the, there's a, some tolerance is satisfied, then you can allow some noisy data. Uh, and um, and also in this setup, we are not actually feeding a uh, solution to the PDE rather than the PDE data in the right-hand side. So uh, in most of the cases, you may know what is your right hand side or right hand side F and G. Um, but if the noise level is greater than what it is imposed, then that is the good question I need to think about a little bit more. But that's a that, that's a very good question. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank thank you, Yanja. Okay, next question is coming from um Sampa. Um he asked. Even in a uh, finite element method, sometimes boundary uh, condition is not perfectly satisfied. For example, uh, non-conforming meshes. Uh, can we similarly relax the boundary condition satisfied condition to just a converging sequence instead? Uh, that's 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 a very good question. Yeah, I think that is a possible. That is a possible because the um, yeah, that's a very good question. Okay. Uh, the next yeah, question I think that is, is a yeah, that is possible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so next question is uh, from Andrew. Um, he asked, 
for the 2D function approximation example of the booking function, uh, did you compare to any classical interpolation techniques that do not use neural networks? They should perform fine in this setting. Ah, yeah, sure. I, we, we didn't test against other uh, classical method because the, our focus was to understand uh, how we can improve the neural network training uh, using uh, shallow neural network at the first. Um, so I think the focus is a little bit different. So our goal is not approximating to find the best approximation tool that approximate the 2D function rather than we devised uh, how we can train the shallow neural network com uh, compared to existing method, like existing method cannot do. But I do believe that if you use some um, uh, orthogonal polynomial, like tensor product or some Fourier basis would perform uh, well for those tasks. Yeah, that's, that's also a good question, yeah. But our main focus was to Okay, let's improve the neural network training because the neural network training is not very solid at the moment. So, yeah. Okay. Um, next question is from Sampa again. Uh, he said, uh, just curious, uh, what does the network architecture for the wave equation look like? For example, uh, it's a very, it's a very simple neural response. network. It's a shallow, shallow network, just a two layer with 200. And we use activation function is the ReLU power. I, I forgot what was the order. I think the ReLU cube or fourth power of the ReLU. Yeah. So it is a dense, dense network. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question from Sophia. Uh, in any pin cases, did you observe the phenomenon of double descent uh, where a model appears to asymptote, but if you give it enough time and epochs, you will observe another descent in error. Uh, that's also a very good question. I haven't focusing on the phenomenon of the double descent because uh, double descent is sort of like understood along the way of the training procedure. So that in terms of the getting minima perspective, I, yeah, okay, to get to the question, Uh, yeah, I do empirically, I do observe some double descent phenomena in training pins, but as you can see in this, the specific examples, you can treat this as a flat of, I mean, double descent. I mean, it's a increasing high and decrease and also increase, decrease, increase, decrease. You, you may think of this as a double descent. I'm not sure whether it is also called a double descent, but I do empirically observe them some double descent. Um, but, but if you give it enough time and applause, you will observe another descent in error. And that's, I'm not quite sure because I usually run training a maximum 1 million iteration. So, uh, mm. but typically 10K. So I'm not quite sure on that part. Yeah. Mm. That sounds like enough epochs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so, um, I don't see any more questions from chat room, uh, but you can unmute yourself and uh, ask a question directly. Um, I, I have a question about the dying probability. Based on the analysis there, it sounds like it's more favorable the neural network is a you know wide, shallow network than the deep, deep, narrow network, right? But the, in, in practice, you know, the deep narrow network is a lot more popular than the shallow wide network. Yeah, so that, that's also a very good question. So yeah. I haven't thought about it. So this is also irrelevant to what I did, but uh, some empirical, my experience is that if you want to express some sort of like uh, sharp changing behavior, like yeah. shock, I would recommend you go with the deep network. Mm. because uh, that is somehow more oriented to, or I would say more efficient to represent the sharp transition. Mm. But if you want some smooth behavior, shallow will do the good job. Mm. So, and also in practical level, uh, deep and narrow network uh, sometimes does not work very well 
in multiple reasons, I think. Uh, one is the initialization, and the other is the uh, the number of the depths quite matter, and also the specific architecture. You, if you use the ResNet or some batch normalization and some other techniques also comes into the play. And personally, I read a couple of papers that some mean field approach of training neural network that indicates that super wide neural network can interpolate like almost anything. But personally, when I tried, I couldn't quite get the same result. And I think the one of the reason is that theoretical one only says that when time goes to infinity or certain number of iteration, uh, then you will achieve some certain desirable error. But in practical case, what I can do is just the 1K or 1 million iteration. So probably that might be one of the reason I might see. I hope that answers what you ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions. Um, is there any, 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 any person who wants to ask directly? Um, uh, can I, can I ask a, a, a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so you you show that the uh, ANLS uh, method is a uh, very good to uh to to solve the um, fatal problem. Um, it must be my fault. I I didn't some I somehow didn't catch what is that method is about. How it differs from the traditional method. Can you like briefly remind me about that method? Uh, active neural least squared. Yes. Mm. Oh yeah. So actually, I didn't explain it. Uh, how the how it this method can be extended to the multi-dimensional case, because the, that is the will upcoming soon. But the main logic is that it's explicit adjustment of the activation function, activation pattern, because the stagnation occurs when you don't change your activation function. So that we. So what GDE takes a long time is that they take a really long time to until they change the new activation function and then they decay fast again. So our idea is, all right, then since the changing activation function, activation pattern takes a long time for traditional method, then why not we manually changing it explicitly? So explicit adjustment of activation pattern is the key idea. Uh, so operationally, how, how do you, change the activation pattern? Ah, so you don't need to access, you don't need to go over all any act, um, uh, loss function. You can just compare your uh, training data and your specific neuron and see how you can change the activation function locally. So uh, I think this, uh, so I think this illustrates very well. So suppose this is your current activation pattern. Then what you can do is move, move to the left then this creates a new activation function, right? This creates another activation function, an activation pattern. I mean, so this is how we generate for one D case. Okay, so I'll probably read your paper to, to for more detail. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So this this procedure is explained in the public, so it will be to appear on uh, SIEM General of Scientific Computing. So. Uh, yeah, this, this is what we mean by explicit adjustment of the activation pattern. So this is the key part how we can efficiently uh, get a good training result. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe, maybe a little bit more on this que question. Do you have to manually find the pattern? So I don't, I don't see how clearly I can generate the pattern, the candidate patterns right so that's also an excellent question so that's that's why we have a upcoming paper on the how we generalize this because in one d case is a left or right so that it's quite easy to see how you can change the activation pattern but in the upcoming paper we have a procedure how we can effectively um, generate the good candidate direction that changed the activation pattern so it will be upcoming soon so but it is some but underlying principle is the same there because in high dimensional case, the same mass, the same approach does not apply because there are infinitely many direction you can change the, your, you can generate the activation pattern, right? So in general case, we have a way to do that and more efficient way so that that's somehow I slicked into those two results in here and here. 
and those results will be available soon, uh, probably and the, at the end of this month. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Okay. Uh, hi, Junior. This is fun. I see fun. And, and uh, actually, I have a first. I have a question about that uh, wave equation. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, um, have you ever tried like Fourier features? I'm very interested in that. Uh, is there any connection between the Fourier features and the activation patterns? Because actually, uh, Fourier features can do the same thing, but I'm 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 wondering if the less activation patterns can explain less phenomena. Mm, that's interesting question. I haven't tried how this Fourier feature uh, can be somehow applied. Actually, I'm not sure whether you remember this example. Actually, I borrowed this example from one of your paper, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm very familiar right? with the example. Yeah, actually, I had a hard time yeah. in that. Yeah, actually, I haven't thought about it in that direction, but uh, I think it must be related to activation pattern, I think, so that by applying the free a transformation, free a feature transformation, somehow your input is somehow easily, uh, somehow become easy format that can be easily, uh, easily change their activation pattern in some sense. Mm. And it should be the reason that we give us a better result. That's my just a high level intuition. But yeah. I don't know the detailed, uh, comment on on the far of this but that's a good question yeah i think yes um regarding to my second question so are you interested in that uh are uh, so familiar with some theoretical or approximation theory of like depot nets uh yes i i did a uh, one work on the depot net approximation i think this is relevant to the active neural needs square right uh yeah yeah my, so if this is the case are you familiar so are you interested in like uh, depot nets with some physical, basically physically informed loss? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. But, That's all my yeah. But I, I yeah, I haven't tried the training depot net, but uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, it's a really nice presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, next question from uh, Surab uh, from chat room. Um, can the plot uh, the phenomenon be addressed with a adaptive learning rate or gradient based uh, annealing methods? If so, how do these methods compare with the performance of the uh, ANLS algorithm? Mm, adaptive learning rate and gradient based annealing method. Um, I'm not quite sure how this adaptive learning rate and gradient based annealing method uh, will. I think we follow the similar principle that you just mentioned in our upcoming paper in addressing the multi dimensional case because we also utilizing the gradient information that suitably uh, change the effectively change the activation pattern. So I think you, what you are asking is really uh, highly connected to our upcoming paper for uh, this generalization of active and neuron distal square. So, uh, but I, I didn't, okay, then now I can see. So one great feature of our active neuron distal square is we actually solve for apply the least square part for getting coefficient to C. So, let me see. So here, so once the internal weights are fixed, then coefficient part can be solved by the list of squares. And one of our scheme is uh, asking us to find uh, what is the solution, the, the neuron that leads to the smallest error decay. And we have a specific algorithm and theorem that can this part can be done very efficiently. So I think that is the one of the key difference and the performance wise, um, I cannot say too much because I haven't compared it with the uh, adaptive learning rate or gradient based uh, annealing method. So if you are mentioning adaptive learning rate is the, uh, I'm not quite sure what exactly adaptive learning rate, but if it is meant to be some scheduled learning rate or some other, uh, learning rate, uh, 
configuration, we haven't really tested. So we just fixed the ADAM to be a to default manner. Or in some cases, though, we somehow fine tuning the learning rate, but constant learning rate. So I hope that answers the question. And I'd like to know more about gradient based annulling method if there exist some packages I can run it to compare. That would be nice. Okay. All right, great. Um, any other questions? Um, I guess it's time to wrap up. Um, but please do not um, do not reluctant to ask a question if you have. No. Okay. Well, let's thank uh, Yeon Jung uh, for the great talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, and and well, actually, there is one more question from OK Clap. Uh, Sarah, of, I think Paris, Pardia uh, Dakis, the the Caris uh, had a wonderful paper on gradient-based uh, annealing methods to address some learning issues of PIMS. Okay, yeah, great, great comment. Okay, thank. Let's thank the professor uh, Shin again uh, for the great talk and. Um, I guess uh, we have a great expectation for the upcoming paper uh, you, you have mentioned several times. Okay, we will yes. we'll make sure to um, uh, double check on it. And okay, th thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, it was thank an you. In person, in person comfort, uh, the seminar, then we could actually clap for you, but virtual. Thank you. Here. Thank you so much for having me today. I really enjoyed the discussion with the audiences and uh, really enjoyed wonderful wonderful so i i hope that um this can be a you know the beginning uh, of the future collaboration i i hope that you can be connected with uh, several people in lawrence livermore and as well as a you know the external people uh, who joined this seminar okay uh with that let's let's end um